So we have this rare opportunity of uh, <laughs> after the SIV chilling with Malin for a little bit. So we're going to ask him some questions and hope you enjoy it. I really like stories that start at the start. You know, it makes sense. How like what? How were you growing up? Did you how did you get into flying? Like what was the spark? There's people that always wanted to fly. Others that you know yeah. found it late. So I yeah I always dreamt of flying. I used to have a, a frustrating or like happy dream of well, there was a an old shed in the in our back garden, and I used to have a dream where I would climb up onto it and I would like I'd fall to the ground and I'd, so I'd have this really frustrating dream of of not being able to fly and then some nights I'd I'd have the dream of like stepping off and and, and zooming up, right. and that was like a reoccurring dream through my childhood. I don't know what like psychologically that means. Probably nothing to do with flying. But <laughs> <laughs> just you'll be surprised at how many people say that exact same thing. Um, and then I, for my 18th birthday, I got a, a ride in like a two seater. You know, you get like an hour's flight in a two seater aircraft, and right. so I got to pilot it and like looking around, like and just being up and seeing the world from that different perspective. It was like, yeah, I need to do this. Um, but then I just thought I was going to have to own a plane to to fly, so I thought it was a bit of a long term project. And then I was at Glastonbury Festival, we used to go every year, I'm a bit worse for wear, and a paramotorist flew over the festival. He subsequently got done for air law, because he shouldn't be flying that low over that many people, but uh, um, I thought, what is that? And so I went yeah. and YouTubed, and then I saw like some amazing things of them, you know, flying above the clouds and things like that. Uh, and what, I, what year was this? That was like 2010. Okay. And I thought, oh, I could afford to do this. Uh -huh. So, um, like, uh, like you shouldn't do. I then got on eBay, brought all that <laughs> in, um, brought some terrible like wings and some some crappy. This is a paramotor, like a crappy paramotor. And then, luckily, didn't try it myself. I went down to um, Phipsy in Cornwall, um, Cloud Nine, and he's got a tow rope from the field. And then I I went just to do paramotoring. Um, but the first half of like the EPCP is like on the toe and then you split and you do powered and paragliding and uh, he said well you might as well do your paragliding as well um, and I just thought that looks really boring you're just going up and down a, a hill all day like um, but oh, it covers <laughs> yeah but it, it covers a wider like um, wind speed so I thought okay it'll, it'll double my chances of, of flying at least Mm. Um, and then I only flew with the motor for like less than a year really. Mm -hmm. like, I ended up with a Bailey four stroke which was lovely mm -hmm. um, but as a form of aviation it's it's a bit rubbish because it's like a really really slow plane. I didn't like doing um, low flying which is what kind of most paramotorists do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why at the time. I think because I wanted to learn to fly to get as high as possible. Right. And actually, Fipsy, the first time I took off and, and flew, he kind of turned his back to get other people ready because he's used to people just buzzing around the field, staying really low. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and two minutes later, on, I was at four and a half thousand feet with the throttle pins like halfway to the coast, and he's like, "Ah, oh, Alan, come back here." And I haven't run out of fuel yet. What's he saying? So, um, yeah, I just I love getting high. The one thing paramotoring that you you don't get very often with paragliding is like going above the clouds and mm. uh, and just going through the valleys and like kicking the the tops that's pretty magical you can get that in in mountains like um especially the higher the mountain the, the clouds form lower and you can so i've had it on a paraglider a few times mm. where you can just choose those little valleys and fly through them above the clouds it's really nice um so that that's the one thing with paramotoring i miss but in terms of just getting high and going somewhere, as soon as you've got a bit of wind, you're just kind of like uh, pretty stationary and it's noisy mm. and, and dirty. So, um, when I then started getting into wind control and SIV, the the disconnection of the wing of like just putting the trimmers on and, and releasing a, a collapsible wing was just like, nah, don't want to do that anymore. So, uh, mm. and and the thought for me with paragliding was, you know, I'd see videos of like the experts doing it and. I thought it would be like really like fine controls because you see people on these higher aspect ratio wings doing these little inputs, which is why I moved up the wings quite quickly. But I really focused on wing control because a low end wing. I think my first wing was a, a rush, so like a, a B, but just these long spongy breaks, and I was like, this isn't what I imagined mm. paragliding would be. So I wanted to get on the higher performance stuff, and then also I got into comps 
fairly early. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how were those first years of actually paragliding? Let's say you paramoted and paraglided maybe at the same time for a year or so, then you kind of left the Bailey on the side. Yeah. Like, how was the, like, what, what did you do? Where did you fly it, take it in the UK? Yeah, so like the UK and um, so Dartmoor, like I'm from Plymouth, so yeah. uh, way down in the southwest. So Dartmoor and we've got coastal sites as well. I think I did the, the, the classic, like the first year, I did like 15 hours, which I think in the UK is like 15 to 25 hours is like the average. Yeah. And then the following year, yeah, I think I did about 25. Um, and then, yeah, it just increased from there. But I think I did my first SIV with like eight hours, which was like a lot of exposure, but oh, not, okay. a lot of, a lot, not a lot of knowledge. How, how did you do that and where did you do it? I did it in Turkey with Jockey. Right. So very different to how we teach. It was like I got to uh, got to taste a bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, Is that what bit you? Because for me, the bug that I got in the UK was enough. It went first cross country. Uh, at, I don't know, twenty hours or fifty hours or something like that, and that was like, wow, this is really can really expand and really stretch my legs here. Yeah. Was that first SIV or no? I mean, what, that, that what was, was just that uh, for you. That was like exposure. The, the thing I took from that first SOV was like there was all this hidden energy. It was the first time I'd experienced like a nose down spiral and like, oh, I'll come out the other side. But bloody hell, like, what's that wing just done to me? Mm. So, yeah, I think G Force was the first thing I took from that. Um, and then I, I did a lot of training by myself. I think that's the difference, like how I moved up wings so quickly was that like I was just as scared as everyone else with wing control, but I did it. You know, so it's not about not being scared, it's about then forcing yourself to do it. So I used it's to go, funny, I was going to ask you that. It's a, like, it seems like you didn't have any fear. You were like straight away. When you said, oh, I went straight up on like your first paramotor lesson, it feels like... No, that, I mean, that, I just wanted to get high. And like, I kind of, <laughs> I, I understand that height is safety. Yeah. So for me, the higher I got, like other than like um, hypoxia, um, yeah. just, being high just gives you like loads of time. Yeah. So I then... I did my next SIV at, I think, 45 hours here with Fabian, uh, and I was on the, the Arctic by that point, the ENC, um, and that went well. Um, and then I, I signed up to the British Championships, and for that I thought, well, I might as well fly a two-liner. So I went back to Turkey and did some training by myself, and I brought the, the Peak 3, mm -hmm. their, their kind of two-and-a-half-liner D. And I was training by myself and my stools were getting like better, but I didn't realise that the higher aspect ratio was more spinny. So I was really keeping the span open on the stools and getting this spin every time. And that's why I tell my students, like if you train by yourself, you need to know what happens when it goes right and wrong. Because I was just repeating these mistakes. Um, and luckily I met, <coughs> I met um, Jess Cox from, from Fly Sussex mm -hmm. and she was doing a course with Russ Ogden. And Guy Anderson was there, and um, Ross and Guy kind of became my mentors, and then we eventually set up the, the British Paragliding Racing Academy. But he, like, a bit like a stray dog on the beach, like and they were like, "What are you doing here by yourself?" I was like, no, just, you know, just doing some training. So like, I, I ended up joining his course. You went over for a force. Yeah, I, I, I like made my own collapse lines. And Russ was like, well, you know, are they all symmetrical? I was like, I didn't really think about that. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, he's like. Yeah, come, come, come here. Yeah. Um, but I'd never, you know, I'd done it progressively. I, I never threw my reserve. Um, but I was on, yes, yeah, so I was on that wing with like 85, 86 hours. I lied to Russ and said, no, oh, 150 hours. And he still looked at me like, what are you doing? I was like, I didn't tell you the truth. Um, but yeah, again, the, the, the course of him went well. I had the free, a freestyle wing as well, so we would like, uh, it was the first time I tr tried like heli, heli stuff, heli training. I went about the following year. Oh, so then I did my first. That that was the training I was doing because I just got the wing mm -hmm. to then go and do the British Championships, which was down in Italy. And that was just I like I love competitions because I get a bit bored flying um, just cross country. Like I've, I've realised that my my stimulation level needs to be quite high. Shifted. Yeah, um, and actually it was interesting, someone said that, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this in a bit, about this, um, this science stuff we're doing with a, a lady called Hannah, she's done a really good thing with um, Gavin McClurg, so she um, is uh, studying vultures, um, 
but uh, yeah, with uh, the video she was filming with these studying vultures, we we basically had to do a do a circuit, and I'm um, listening to music, and I've got my hands off my Enzo, like on speed bar, kind of playing with some stuff, and the guy, the other guy in the in the course is like. Like fucking hell, it's not even enough st stimulation to be flying a comp wing. You have to be listening to music <laughs> and you're like playing with stuff. Like, so I think maybe that's um, that is that was an eye opener that it's something that my weakness, like I have to work on because when um, when it gets weak and I'm stuck somewhere for ages, I don't do well because I very quickly get into the the, the kind of drowsy and absent minded mode. Mm. So I think I like that, that added stimulation. And comps can give you that because you are flying kind of at the edge of your seat. But uh, it's not necessarily the adrenaline for me in comps. It's the knowing that you could have done better. Mm. Like on any given day, like someone has done it the most efficiently. And if you're behind him, then at some point throughout that 100k, there was something he did better. And when you start flying with the best in the world, you just realise like if you think you're good at climbing and then they outclimb you, they know something that you don't, and that that is like so. Like, how can I get in your mind and figure that out? Um, I, I love that. So, the first day of that first comp, I was like the start went, and this was like the Enzo one days, and I had that that peak three. So I pushed half bar, and they all pushed full bar, and they just start disappearing off into the into the distance. Um, so then the very next day, I was like, well, it's full bar then, and so it was like my speed just like doubled. I was like, oh, that's, that's it. I've just got to go full bar. Um, and then towards the end of the week, like being able to just like s at least see the lead gaggle in the distance rather than just disappearing like spaceships. Um, so you can really like I don't know you can see your progress um, mm -hmm. through comps, and it's just a, it's a it's a kind of cheap guided week as well. Like you get amazing retrieves, um, and you see parts of a place that you wouldn't normally see. Like if this was your first time to Annecy, you might do the petty tour, but you're not going to jump over the back into the bigger mountains. It's like, oh, what's behind there? And I don't know the valley winds, but if you come here for a comp and they set a turn point there, yeah, you'll go in there and you'll go in there with a hundred people. So like people get low and you're like, oh, I don't want to go there. And you know, they kind of map all the air mm -hmm. and then you see so much more of a, of a region. Um, so I love it. And then you kind of get to know people in the comp scene and uh, you get this little community yeah. going. So that's kind of really, I don't know. That's kind of the, the the course of my of my flying. Really, sounds um, sounds very reminiscent of other people that uh, were like quite on it straight away and got had a very like steep progression, mm. kind of driven by like just wanting to do stuff and tr try stuff. Yeah. So 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 you still do comps. Yeah. Uh, you still put plenty of your know, flying agenda very much around comps. Yeah. But at some point, it sounds like you have a bit of two loves, like competition flying and also acro and SIV and all that stuff. So where where did you, you know, after you maybe first or second comp, like you're saying, and realising that you can learn a lot and you can put yourself against other people, when did you start going more into the, you know, your fourth, your fifth SIV or maybe even um, talking to Fabian? Yeah, uh, that, I mean that was years later. So, what happened then? I did an SIV here. Uh, so I did some of Russ after that training, and then I just started. I got kind of good enough to just start training by myself rather than doing specific courses. Um, and then, like I made so many mistakes in my comp career because I, I got on to comp wings then pretty fast. So. Um, I can't remember, like I had about 150 hours when I was flying the, the full-on triple C wings and only now after a, another over a thousand hours on them I realised how inefficiently I've been flying them mm. because they, yeah, I don't know, I think if you take a thousand hours to get on one you've learned like everything about pitch and roll and um, all the little in intricacies of flying, whereas mm -hmm. I was still quite like even though my I could do I could do things like in the box that most other people can't do on two liners. Mm -hmm. I was still not a very good cross country pilot in a way. Two different being safe two, and being fast are two very different two things. Two very different things, yeah. So like my I have not had a, a meteoric rise in um, uh, in comps because I would always choose to get on the highest level comp I could to try and see how the best do it 
which really damages your results. And also, I wasn't flying. You know, I'm competing against people that have got two, three thousand hours more than me, and I'm not flying efficiently. Um, so, yeah, I, I was. I, my wing wasn't letting me down, and I could handle the wing, but I wasn't flying it as if you know, like someone who's got a couple thousand hours more. And I think again, part of me becoming an instructor and breaking down what makes you. Uh, like thermal well and fly well and the movements of the glider before I was just like I'm flying an Enzo and I can keep it open and I can stall it and like this is awesome this is it I've, I've done it I've, re I've reached the level um, rather than um, yeah still being like more analytical mm -hmm. um, I just I just love the fact that I can remember some times in Sant Andre like boom absolutely pumping conditions and like karate chopping the wings like <laughs> just like this is awesome um just like yeah loving it knowing that it could fly that level of wing mm. and, and keep it open and uh, and fly it fast but there's, there's much more to be in this is the than... cool thing about the sport isn't it it has this depth to it where you can be safe you can get into acro and get to fastest wing mm. with the most aggressive things and handle it but that still doesn't mean that you can win a comp or it means that you're going to get the world record in Brazil, which yeah, is yeah. a completely different beast altogether. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Physiological stuff, get involved, and there's just so much to learn, it's so cool. Yeah, and that's why like, uh, I want to push myself to do some more long distance flying because that's, that's something I've never done, and that will really challenge me to not get bored um, and for my stamina. Why I like comps as well is like, I like flying, like, if, if it was a nice cross-country day and I had a bit of time to go out, I, <coughs> I'd do 80 to 100k, but I'd try and do it in, you know, under three hours. That's the sort of flying I like, and that's the sort of flying you do in, in, in cross-country. So for me, it's more about my average speed. If, I, if I'm, like, above 30 when I go cross-country, I don't care if I run it on 60k. Mm. So I've done it in above, you know, above Fast. 30, okay. Um, uh, because the endurance stuff, like, I get bored. I think last year the, the most I did was 140k and I was coming back past my house just like cruising along the RV just like oh my house is there yeah there's two hours left in the day but nah just like okay, nah. I think of all the things that I should be doing rather than yeah. like in the air so yeah that's something I need to push myself in you're more uh, you're more formal one than Le Mans exactly yeah yeah that's a nice uh, analogy <laughs> and then with Acro like I'm definitely not an Acro pilot but there's only so much you can do and when I got to the point on the Enzo of, of like, you know, ripping holes in it and doing, you know, dynamic stalls and like starting to spin to stall and stuff like that and, and just going full power all the time, then you're just wrecking your equipment. So Acro for me, it keeps me in touch with my students because when I'm trying something new and I'm flying unfamiliar kit, it's not there's much more like apprehension and mm. Um, and when I'm trying something completely new, it's, it's just like my students in that there's the fear of the unknown and there's like, what is this going to feel like? What sensations am I going to have? So I like to push myself in acro to stay, to stay grounded. Mm. Um, and I've, I've kind of started to enjoy it now. Like before it was like, well, I'll do it because um, it's built for the, the task and I'm, I'm not going to wreck my, my kit. Mm. Uh, but now I'm actually quite enjoying it. Um, and I can then I can become the student myself and I can see how like I get the tunnel vision and then it starts to grow and then I can look somewhere else. Everything I tell you guys to do, I can do myself and, and it's really to see the work that we teach like back on myself. Yeah. It's like, yeah, okay, we're on a, yeah, so doing the right thing. What do you see for the future? Like what excites you and let's say maybe not over the next, next one or two years because you've got a decent plan for that but over the next maybe too far away to stay, but five or ten years, what's, what do you look forward to, what would you like to get mm. done, places you'd like to go, or things to do? Yeah, so technology is going to be the next big thing, and the work that we're doing with Hannah, so I touched on it briefly earlier, um, so she, she's done a really good podcast with Gavin, if you want to know more about her, but I've done two sessions with her now, um, last year there was a group of five or six of us to do this kind of like trial um, trial setup, and then this year with the race academy, we had a boot camp here, and with so like thirty pilots, we got suited and booted with all of her, um, all of her kind of um, gadgets, and the stuff that she is going to find out about paragliding is going to be like there's going to be a lot of world firsts, 
And it's like I was talking earlier about when you go to a high level PwC and someone out climbs you and you like you don't know what they know that you don't. She's going to be able to like lift the veil on all of that. Um, so she'll know about you know your bank angle, the G force, where these better pilots are looking, how well they're controlling their roll, how often they adjust their turn. All these little minute details that add up to being better at climbing or picking a better line. Um, hopefully she'll be able to uncover all of that. And the, 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 the information she's giving back to us is, is unreal at the moment. So it's, I think it's going to exceed like, all of our expectations as well. In terms of SIV instructing, um, I would like anyone watching this that's, that's good at VR and all that sort of stuff and get in touch because I think the, the VR side of things um, would massively help because basically SIV is you know simulation to incident on vol, so simulating flight incidents. But even though it's a simulation over the lake, there is G-force and there's fear. If you can have a simulation of the simulation of it, the real life events, you you take the fear away. The fear that blinds people. Exactly. Yeah. Them. So they can at least then start to because I mean you know how long it took you about the roll and the, what we talk about the exit window and all that sort of stuff. You're dealing with that in a dynamic situation. It's a bit more difficult. So if that could be done classroom based first of all, so you understand that okay when I'm in a rotation, I'm going to get this roll and this is how I stop it. Then you've got that base of, with the fear subtracted to then go and do it in a dynamic situation mm -hmm. to then if it happens you know, you deal with it. So that's where I'd like to see the the next progression. We're going to have an interesting chat after this. Uh, <laughs> good, good. Um, yeah, because I, I looked at these kind of six axis like platforms and they're quite expensive. I think it'd be worth it, but you'd have to set up a, a stiff, um, you know, thing so it's actually turned. That that could help. But even just sitting here, the thing I is... I was just about to say, even this setup that you've got going on now, like yeah. the, the classroom <clears throat> might look like this. In, that, a, in a couple of years' time, where everyone sat in their own little yeah, uh, even just be able to do you know to do something. Uh, the, the thing is, if it's not moving, what, what your eyes are seeing, it could make people sick pretty quickly. So it'd be good to get all the movements and that down as well. Uh, but that'd be amazing to do like a little classroom-based stuff and then go and do it, just because mm. it would yeah, people would understand the movements much more, um, yeah. and it would accelerate their learning for sure. Um, so then with our like the software before the course where there's like there'll be tens of hours of learning and then coming and doing the simulation then doing it um, it's, it's just a way of making it more efficient because for sure like there's how, however little the risk is there is a risk over the lake uh, you might end up throwing your reserve or whatever so the more you can understand when you're in that box and also the, the more you understand the less fear there is so actually the more you're in the learning mode then just the more you'll get out of the course. So yeah. that's what I'd like to see in the, in yeah, the makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you look at it, there's people that are flying that don't know what they're doing. There's people that are flying that definitely know what they're doing. And the only difference is not ability, is knowledge for the most part. So the problem yeah. that you're trying to fix is transfer of knowledge. Yeah. And if you go from someone talking to someone talking in a whiteboard to someone talking and showing mm -hmm. a video to someone talking and maybe playing a game to actually doing it, it's all like more and more and more efficient way yeah. of knowledge transfer. Yeah, so. and everyone learns differently. That's mm. why when we, when I do the briefing, you know, it's like kind of written down or it's talking, it's videos, it's you, you're trying to deal with everyone's like best learning model. Mm. So yeah, like I said, the more, the more ways you can get that information through, the better. Yeah. So yeah, that's what excites me. And then what we were talking earlier about my, the, the, the flying progression for me, and it's going to seem obvious, but it was moving abroad. And then I came into this school environment, which is awesome, because when I was shadowing Fab, I was also doing a lot of, of runs, like whenever there was space or whenever I could get up the hill, I was mm -hmm. um, I was going for it. So that really excelled my my flying. But, you know, top to bottom here is, you know, you have like 800 metres. So what's that? Two, 2,000 feet in the UK, you need a good day to get that high, and then you probably want to go cross country because it's a mm. good day. You don't want to or don't want to play, but even on an overcast day here, you can do a top to bottom and get some training in. Or um, like there should always be a goal, and that's something that, that Kriegel and Thomas say. So uh, through the race academy, I um, did some training with Thomas through that um, mm. Kriegel's um, trainer, and then last year again we did like 10 sessions with actually a girl called. Um, 
uh, Steph, but she's part of the one day coaching mm -hmm. on the mental training, the aspects of teaching um, sports psychology, and all that's been super interesting. But really setting a goal every time you go flying is, is really important. And when you become a cross country pilot, you're, you're just looking for the good days. And it's a real shame because you should go out on the marginal days to train and things like ground handling. That's why really good cross country pilots end up not being very good at launching because it's been five or 10 years before they've actually spent time ground handling. Um, so it's really important going to the hill when you know you're not gonna beat your PB and you're not gonna do that 100K to do some ground handling, do some wagger, get a bit of height, do, you know, do a rapid exit, do some wing Get weak lift and be patient. Yeah, and be patient. That's, that's, there's, there's, that's the, those are the moves that Kriegel always wins the X Alps with, yeah. is the marginals where people might just do top to bottoms and it just sticks with it and yeah. just run, runs away with it. And if it's a terrible day and you know that a top to bottom like here is like 10 minutes, it's like, okay, well I'm gonna try and stay in there for 15 minutes. So you just gotta kind of eke out everything, even though you're slipping off the mountain, you've maintained five more minutes than if you just flew straight to the landing. There's, mm. there's always, like you should always have a goal in mind. Um, yeah, so really my, my flying, yeah, increased massively. And, and uh, currency is like a big thing. Like if you, every single flight you do something dynamic, when something dynamic then happens to you, it doesn't feel like a, an, an event, you know? Whereas if you haven't done any, uh, any G-force for like six, eight months and you have it happen, it's like, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty crazy. So that's another thing we're living here and having the luxury of, of height is um, once you get your level up, it's very easy to maintain it and not have these kind of like mm. drops back down. So um, yeah, move. Don't live in England if you want to get good at paragliding, basically. <laughs> I you guys like, already know that, but yeah, yeah. for anyone watching, like, and the thing with emigrating is you, you suddenly realise, like, I mean, it's hard when you have like your friend group and your mm. and everything, but then when you move abroad, you realise that actually, if you were like born nowhere and you had to like look on a map for the best like place to live, I mean, we'd all we'll probably live in Barbados, but you know, you, you wouldn't look at you the wouldn't. UK and be like, I want to live there and paraglide. It's yeah. like a terrible yeah. idea. So. Yeah, if, if ultimately you want to get good. And that's a reason why I don't do other sports as well, because I kind of made a choice that if I was going to get good at paragliding, it yeah, had to be my, my full, full attention. Mm. I think before kids and, and marriage, I would have probably done base jumping and, and not been really? here. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to do wingsuiting. Um, but I just wouldn't now, not with the death statistics. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, the, and the journey to get there would would detract completely from, from it's, this. It's very committed. I've thought about it a couple of times myself, and yeah. if I did it, I'd like to do it properly, which means you have to go on a particular journey that is a, a lot of commitment, a lot of time, and a lot of money. Yeah, for sure. Uh, to do it properly. You, you know, you could just go and jump off, but no, no one wants yeah. to do that. Yeah. And I, I did um, kite surfing for the first time at Christmas. I was out in um, Egypt. Um, and took to that really easily, because it's the same sort of movements. Um, of the glider but it's weird when I do stuff like that it feels like I'm doing a sport as in like it's a hobby like oh yeah I could do this sport but when I fly it doesn't feel like it feels like it's your life yeah I don't feel like I'm partaking in a sport it's a bit like when you're walking you're not like oh yeah I'm just I'm doing this walking thing it's just something you do yeah and uh, I don't view flying as something that it's not something I couldn't do it's like I couldn't just go and they go I'm not doing that walking thing anymore I'm just uh, yeah yeah. If only you could sprout some wings. Yeah, it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> then you wouldn't have to pack up and pack. Do you have any more questions or anything you, else you'd like to say? You were kind of touching on it, um, and I thought about like what your plans are for the future, and obviously mm -hmm. like saying that you don't think you see yourself getting into the sport, but, but you were saying earlier that you get bored easily or that you take a lot of stimulus. Yeah. Is there anything that you've not done yet in paragliding that you really want to do that would like pique your interest or like a place that you've not been to yet that you really want to go to? Because obviously you said you're really happy here and this is like the best place for getting everything but yeah. because you're someone who gets, not gets bored but like needs a lot of stimulus, do you think there's something that you think mm, eventually I want to move and I want to do that or uh, would you see yourself living anywhere else or flying anywhere else or... Um, definitely not living anywhere else yeah. because this is paradise. Heaven, heaven. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I bought a house which I've spent the last five years renovating. It's nearly finished. So, 
Um, yeah, in the future, in the next couple of years, like I have been very focused on getting Flyo to a point that I'm happy with, and mm -hmm. I feel like we're nearly there. Like this winter, we're going to develop a bit more and move offices, so doing a bit more than maybe I'd like. But it's really getting to a level where I'm like, yeah, this is I feel like we're offering a. You know, I, I really think we do off, offer like the world's best SIV course, uh, and I still want to make it better. So this is getting to the point where I'm happy. All of my spare time has gone into building my house, which is nearly done. Mm -hmm. So soon I want to have more time than I know what to do with, and uh, I just want to get better at flying. Um, uh, Acro, I've done as a way of, like I said before, uh, it's just been a little thing to to progress me more. But I'd like to focus a bit more on that. And then I've always been quite with my competitions, like just focusing on the goals rather than uh, the, the the feeling of it. So, um, you know, I got on the British team, which was like a goal, and I think I've been selected three times for that now. Um, so then there is more performance goals of getting into the, the worlds on the team. Um, but I would always fly like a slightly bigger wing with loads of ballast, and there is there's things that take away the enjoyment and mm -hmm. you know enjoyment you get um so now i actually want some like i was thinking of changing my harness from the fully heavy comp harness to one a bit lighter so i can do more cross country with it because you're not tempted by the submarine no that that's the kind of thing that i'm talking about is that i Instead don't want to go for sh what is theoretical sheer performance going yeah. for something that gives you comfort and maybe makes you fly better exactly and, and because i'll I'm going to be able to free up some time to fly more. Um, the reason why, on a, if it's just an, a nice cross country day, um, like I have, a lot, I have lightweight equipment, so I'll grab like the Zeolite on my lightweight because I don't want to take my comp stuff up there because it weighs 30 kilos and it's a, it's a faff. Whereas I would much rather fly the Enzo all the time. So I just want kit that's going to make me want to grab it and, and go flying rather than kit. It's like, oh god, I've got to like try and waddle off launch with. Like when I was flying the medium Enzo, it was, it was 40 kilos above my above my naked weight, which mm. kind of detracts from the fun of it. Mm. So I can see now basically personal development in my flying because mm. I can see massive improvements I can make um, in my in my comp flying, in my acro flying that I've not had the time to be you know consistent with. Mm -hmm. um, and then I want to do some online videos as well. Um, that I think is going to be the big next step as well. Um, I was I, I freed up like three weeks this summer to do the training, and then ended up just working on the house all the time. Mm -hmm. So that that will come to an end. I will have more time. It's always that kind of like next next year I'm going to yeah, do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so in the next, if I had to look at like the next three years, it will be the house will be done, and I will hopefully have some online um, courses out and have become a better pilot again because it's never that's what i love about it even though you know i do the the highest level pwc's and i've been on the british team i still when when i when i look at the best pilots in the world i am um, i've just like maybe got my foot in the door yeah. or i'm fumbling for the keys i'm not even opened the door yet so <laughs> there's always deals. someone there's some yeah there's always someone above you that you can learn from um so that's where i'm at, at the moment and at Crow, i've got no great ambitions to you know, do the 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 stuff, the, the 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 highest level things that the guys are doing now is like insane, and it's not it's not that practical for me. Like I'm not interested in twisted things or anything, but just to be um, doing acro stress free is very different to when I do acro now because I dip in and out of it. Mm -hmm. It's always like I'm I'm just kind of like trying to get that vision back, and it's all a bit. Uh, a bit stressful uh, to do some of the things I haven't done for a long time so just to be uh, um, yeah a bit more consistent with that sort of flying as well um, what I, I love doing here is hike and fly we do a lot of single skin stuff we do a lot of like running up mountains I, I love that sort of stuff taking off from you know little launches doing that sort of like technical thing um, so yeah that's it do I know that this is a long time away because your kids are still young. Do you think your kids will ever get into paragliding? And would you be? I don't know. Yeah, I've been flying ever since. Like, well, I think their first flight was at like two and a half. Um, really? Yeah. For both, for <laughs> cool. both. I took guys the first time the other day. Um, Layla likes going up with me. Um, I'm not that fussed really. My, my dad was quite into sailing when I was younger. 
and it put me off because I was just always on a, on a boat. I was a skinny little kid and never had a decent <laughs> wetsuit, and I was just getting splashed like this. Shit. Um, you know, paragliding. If it can go my, one way or the other. You yeah. can really encourage him into it or really discourage him. Yeah. Also, it's it's not a good sport to be bad at. That's my yeah. um, my favourite saying with it. And you know, there there are like risks to it. So, I think it's important that they do a sport and that I mean, it gives you kind of like a purpose. So whether mm -hmm. it's paragliding or gymnastics or whatever mm -hmm. i hope they they find a, a hobby that they they love enough that it just becomes not a hobby like something that they need to do yeah. i don't really care if it's paragliding or something else yeah. um i hope i don't put them off by taking them out and that they want to like go on a tandem flight or whatever with me um, at some point um but yeah i'm not interested it doesn't bother me if they get into it or not yeah, just yeah. As, long, as long as they have a kind of a a, a drive or, or a goal in life with uh, with some sport. Cheers, dude. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.